Once again, it is great to be in worship with you this morning, and uh, so glad you're a part of what's going on here at Florence Church. We're in the middle of a, of a sermon series called How to Be Rich, and so if you're uh, new with us today or you haven't been here in a couple of weeks, just trust me, these are just purely symbolic. There is absolutely nothing in these boxes right here, as much as I might wish that there was. We have been talking about finances, we've been talking about our stewardship, and uh, Again, in the third week of a series called How to Be Rich. Uh, every day, you and I, we're, we're surrounded by people trying to tell us how to get rich. And there's all kinds of ways to possibly get there. But we have discovered that, in fact, most of us sitting here already are rich. Many of us have crossed the line from not rich to rich. And we didn't even know and the reason we probably didn't know is because we, we don't necessarily feel rich. And, and maybe the reason we don't feel rich is that uh, we lack financial margin in our lives. Most of us sitting here today fall into a category of maybe the top one to one half percent of wage earners in the world. Even one to two percent wage earners here in America. Do you remember what our definition of rich was to help broaden our thinking? It was this, remember? God has blessed us with more than we need. We are rich. God has blessed us with more than we need. We are rich. And in 1 Timothy, Paul, who was a rich man, who lost it all when he became a follower of Jesus Christ, is writing to a younger man, a younger preacher named Timothy, and so I want to, once again, bring that passage to the front of our minds. You'll find it, of course, in that middle panel of the bulletin where scriptures are listed. Follow as I read it one more time this week. You follow along. I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul writes and says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. This is God's word for us today, and our response is thanks, thanks be to God. God. Paul says... Tell the rich Christians these things. Again, the rich Christians these things. First, help them admit the fact that they are rich. And we kind of confess that that first week. You'll remember the first lesson we learned was we have to admit it. I am rich. The second lesson of last week was tell them don't be arrogant and do not trust in your wealth. God has made us rich, but we are not going to lean into, you remember I had a little stack of money over there in the middle. Uh, we're not going to lean into that stack, but we're going to lean into the one who richly provides for us. Today's lesson, Paul says, command them to do good. He doesn't say, interestingly enough, command them to be good, because in fact, really, the whole rest of the Bible talks about being good. And he is not commanding us to do good in the sense that, you know, everybody's supposed to do good. Tell the rich people to do good as only rich people can do. This isn't, uh, this isn't average good. This is rich people good. He defines what he means by saying good to be rich in good deeds. You know, not just average good deeds. Uh, you know, the lady fell down, and so I reached over and I helped her up. Or, you know, I saw this guy needed a buck, so I gave him a dollar. Um, I went over and I, and I shoveled the widow's, the snow off the widow's sidewalk. No, that, that's average good. That's good. No, tell these rich people to learn to leverage their extra for the sake of others in a way that only rich people can do. Here's what Paul knew about rich people. True then and very, very true today. And that is, stay with me, rich people have extra time. Rich people have extra time. We don't feel like we have extra time, but we do. You know, most of us get two days off every week from work. That's unheard of in most of the world today. 
it was really unheard of even in America before not too many decades ago. Most of you have vacation days and, and you know, you actually get paid and you don't even have to show up for work. You get two weeks off, three weeks off, some four weeks off perhaps. Some of you only actually work four days a week. It's a tough four days, but you only work four days a week. You have extra time. Interestingly, surveys reveal that the less extra time that people seem to have, the more they end up using it to serve others. And that often isn't true with rich people. And there might be a lot of reasons for that. And one of the reasons might be we have just so many options, you know? Am I gonna to go to the Bengals game? Am I gonna to go to the Reds game? Am I gonna to go to FC Cincinnati game? Am I gonna to go to the UC game, NKU game, Thomas More game? Uh, am I gonna to go to the movies tonight? Am I gonna go out to eat later on this afternoon? We have options on the weekend. People invite us to go places with them. You know, you might have an extra house, a summer cottage, or, or you know, you may be one of those that has, you know, vacation points or even airline points. We have so many, we are rich in options. So, when there's an extra weekend or there's an extra week, we sit down and we ask ourselves, how can we take this extra time and fill it up with something that we would enjoy? How can we fill our extra time to do something that will bring us pleasure? <clears throat> How can we use our extra time on us? Hmm. You live in a world, and, and so do I, <laughs> so do I, that is constantly programming us to ask the question, what can I do with my extra time for me? What if we asked? Just, just what if we asked? How can I leverage some of that extra time as only a rich person can do for the sake of somebody else? And isn't it interesting, you know, you, you'll go to a movie, spend money, come out and say, oh, it's okay. A restaurant, oh, it's okay, not sure I'll go back. Uh, the hotel was nice, but you know, not the best one I've been at. Um, you know, went on vacation, it was fun, but it wasn't like the greatest time we've ever had. But you go spend some hours working in a shelter with people who are in need. You go spend half a day serving somebody else, go on a short-term mission trip, and you will never come back from those events saying, what a total waste of time. Nah, that was okay. No, you're gonna come back exhausted, but you're gonna come back motivated, and you wanna tell the story, and the next time you get the opportunity, you are ready to go. Paul says, I I'm, I'm not talking to average people. I'm talking to rich people, rich Christians. You know, whatever's average out there, I want you to go beyond that because you are rich. The truth is, not only are we rich in options when it comes to our time, rich people are rich in options when it comes to our money. You knew I was going to get there, didn't you? Our culture tells us, spend all your money on on us because you know there's always something else to wear that there's always something else to listen to and a new way to listen to it something else to buy something new to drive there's always another place to live and then and then it seems that we say this silly thing that can I just be right up front and say, I hope I never hear any of you ever say this. And if you do, just can I invite you to just eliminate that from your list from your vocabulary. And it is this. Well, you know, I just really appreciate the finer things. I, I just really appreciate the finer things. You know what the truth is? Your ability to appreciate, to appreciate the finer things just happened to coincide with the increase in your income. When you started making money, your taste changed. And everybody, hear me, everybody in marketing understands that. You don't appreciate the finer things. It's just that you're able to afford them now. Paul says, that's not how to be rich. That, that may be a little closer on how to be selfish. And quite honestly, none of us need lessons on how to be selfish. We're just good at it. We need to develop a lifestyle of generosity that, that surpasses average. 
I mentioned last week when I was talking about my stat getting higher. It seems the more money a person makes, the harder it seems to be able to give. And part of that may just simply be this. It's easy to give a dollar out of 10 because, I mean, after all, what can you do with a dollar? Or to give, you know, $10 out of 100 because eh, $10 isn't that much. Or, or maybe give $100 out of 1,000 because then that really does make you feel good. I gave $100. But you start giving 1,000 out of 10,000 and you start saying, I could do a lot with $1,000. And suddenly the more you make, the harder it is to give. And then suddenly you're making $100,000 and you start to think, what? Am I going to just give away $10,000? Are you kidding me? And all of a sudden, rich people start to question if they can do that. And God says, come on. Learn to be rich. Overgive. Extend your giving. Be creative. Paul is telling Timothy, don't assume just because they're rich they're going to give. You're going to have to tell them, be generous. Don't let your lifestyle ramp up with your income. Hear me, God gives us margin, not for us, but for the sake of what God wants to do through us. Let me say that again. God gives us margin, not for us, but for the sake of what God wants to do through us, into the world. I've always been heavily convicted by this little story that is true. John Wesley, founder of, United, of Methodism, figured out when he was a young scholar teaching and receiving 30 pounds a year in England back in the 1700s, that he could live on 28 pounds a year. And so he did. And he gave away the other two pounds. He continued to live on 28 pounds a year for the rest of his life. Even in years when he earned over 1,400 pounds in that year, he gave away 90%, 98% of his income. So, how does this work out in the real world? I mean, because what I'm preaching here, and believe me, I know, this is hard. No one feels like they have extra time. We certainly don't feel like we have a whole bunch of extra money. So how do we practice being rich in good deeds and in terms of our generosity? How do we do that? Well, here's part of what I think we have to do. I think... We have to intentionally choose to pre-decide to give time and money to specific things. You know, the natural tendency is just to be kind of a spontaneous giver and, or a spontaneous server. Something comes up and you, you, know, you run over there and you help out or they needed $100 here or an extra 50 there and you jump in and you're part of it. I believe the rich way the Apostle Paul was talking about means we have to pre-decide. Have to pre-decide. Because you know, if you don't pre-decide, you know what you're going to end up giving God and, and, the, and the needy world around us and the rest of the world, you're going to end up giving them leftovers. You know, in the world of food, leftovers are for us. You know, you go to the fridge and you open up the fridge and let's see what we got there. Let's see, we got some uh, green beans, got some old lasagna, we got, uh, we got two pieces of pizza, we got a, whoa, Pam, did you cook something fuzzy? What is that? <laughs> but you know, if you don't pre-decide about your time and your money, the world, the kingdom of God, is always going to get what's left over. And again, that's not how to be rich. You ever heard the term mm, dollar cost averaging? Some of you I know are very familiar with it, maybe new to some. Dollar cost averaging is when you pre-decide to have a certain amount of money taken out of your paycheck once a week, once a month, however you get paid, and you pre-decide to put that money into some kind of investment uh, instrument. Automatically, it just goes there, and it's, it's a pre-decision. I think the only way to be rich the right way, and especially in this culture, is to dollar cost average some of your time. To uh, 
dollar cost average some of your money into kingdom and charity work? How do you predecide to do that with your time? Well, let me let me recommend the following. Set aside a specific amount of time and invest it into a certain organization or or maybe two and move away from being only a random, I heard a phone call, there was an announcement at church, spontaneous server, and start being a systematic server. Take our church, for example. There's so many people that make this church go on a regular basis. People volunteer for the music to be as it is, for Sunday school to be as it is, even for there to be coffee and refreshments out here every week in, week out, waiting for us. In a couple months, the lovely flowers that'll be out in the flower beds around the church, the banners, the decorations, even someone to set up Holy Communion and and take it down after we're done here in a few few moments. Then there's, of course, uh, Wednesday night life meals. Someone has to set it up. Someone has to serve it, clean up. There's hooptastic and fantastic Fridays for the kids. Even the people are investing in, in Florence Church all the time. And, and you're going to see there's just some pictures that are going to scroll of some of the some of the events that are happening around us. You know, as we pack our power packs, as we put things together for the Grace Homeless Feeding Ministry, when it's our turn on a, on a Sunday night. Some of the short term mission trip teams are there. Of course, Night to Shine is Friday. I believe every single person here who is rich. And by that, I mean you have a margin in time needs to pre-decide that you're going to choose an organization, again, maybe maybe two, and invest some of that extra margin there. What do I mean? Well, let's just say I get three weeks of vacation. I'm going to spend two of those on me and the family, and I'm going to give one of them away. Uh, I get every weekend off this month. I'm going to spend three of them on us, and I'm going to give one of them away. I've got a day free coming up. I'm going to spend part of that day serving in a mission. The key is that it can't just be spontaneous. That's what average people do. You really need to pre-decide that you're going to give certain time away, and then you will find yourself looking back at a month or two or a year or two or five or a lifetime and suddenly realize you spent it all on you. Rich people think ahead. Rich people plan ahead. And let me tell you what's going to happen. You pick an organization and invest an amount of time over and over and over and a piece of your heart is going to go there. The, the problem with random, only, you know, spontaneous volunteering is that your heart never gets to blow up any bigger than it already is. It's when you invest in the same group or organization over and over that a piece of your heart goes there. And, and you need to decide. Maybe somebody here needs to decide. I'm going to go get trained as a Red Cross volunteer. And I'm going to be ready the next time there's a crisis and someone needs to go. Who needs to pre-decide right today, perhaps, or in the days that are ahead, that you're going to go do the legwork, the Google search, and you're going to find out how you can be a part of the next Habitat for Humanity build, house build here in Boone County? Let me ask you right now, what are you going to do with your spring break? It's just around the corner. Or with your summer vacation? Did you know that the dates and and the materials are already set for vacation Bible school? We're talking June 15 to 19. Write it down. It's already going to happen. Who here needs to pre-decide that you're going to make an investment of some kind in that absolutely fantastic ministry to our kids this summer? Which family needs to, to, to think about it, pray about it, talk about it, and decide that you're going to take a family vacation and you're going to go down to the Redbird Missionary Conference and spend days down there in eastern Kentucky? Or maybe over to West Virginia, there's a trip being planned right now. Or maybe someone here needs to be part of a trip to Thailand this summer. Again, there's a trip being planned right now. Only rich people get to think this way. In terms of your money, I think you need to take a percentage of your money, and this is what rich people can do, and you just pre-decide. Become a percentage giver. 
I am going to give a percentage of my money and it's going to be committed ahead, ahead of time already. And can I just say, don't, don't, don't get committed to 10 or 12 organizations. Pick two or three that your family loves and you want to get invested in and you can be committed to and give that organization a piece of your heart. You need to be a percentage giver. You, you knew I was going to say this. You need to learn how to tithe. You might need to say, God, I'm going to reduce my lifestyle so that I can take 10% or 15%. Some of you sitting here are in a position in life, God bless you, you can take 20%, 25%. When that paycheck comes in or that bonus comes in, that that amount is already set, already committed, because we've pre-decided. Now, you need to give to your church. You knew I would say that. But you need to be giving to organizations outside the church as well. Lord, teach us how to be rich and to not just follow what the culture's telling us to do. Paul tells Timothy, you tell the rich people, be rich in good deeds. You have, a plan, you have to plan ahead to be rich in good deeds. Pick a percentage. Consider what percentage is already gone, already committed. And this won't happen with just leftovers. It happens with pre-decided giving. And I really don't think there's any way to be good at being rich without being a percentage giver. So for some here, some here, start with 5%. Start right there. Some of you need to move on up to 10%. Some here have been giving 10% since you were, you were just kids. and Because that's just the way you were raised. I mean, I told you my story about my paper route money. Some of you here... <laughs> I know some of you here might be afraid not to give 10% because you know your parents would come up out of the grave and haunt you if you didn't give your 10%. But let me ask, have you been giving at the same level for the past 30, 40, 50 years? What else do you do today that you, do, that you did at the same level 40 years ago? Probably nothing. Maybe it's time to grow up a bit in your giving. But I just thought God wanted me to give 10%, and that's all that God wanted was 10% of my money. No, God wants you to learn how to be rich. You know if you can give more than 10%. And it may not necessarily be all to the church. You, you might need to give some of that extra percentage to some other organization that's out there building the kingdom of God in the world today. Maybe somebody here with that extra needs to be building a church or digging a well in some other part of the world. Can you imagine the different perception there might be of Christianity if Christians truly were the most generous people in the world? Paul tells Timothy, tell those rich Christians they have an opportunity most of the world doesn't have. Don't use all the extra on you. God has allowed you to make a difference in the world. Why? Because you're rich. So let's put it this way. Since I have more, I should do more and give more. Would you just repeat that statement with me? Since I have more, I should, I should do more and give more. That's, that's how to be rich. So every week we've kind of had the little talk back to the preacher time. So uh, here we go. First one, let's say it together for week number one. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. Week number two. I will not trust in my riches, but in God who richly provides today. And since I have more, I will, I will do more. more. I will give more. Friends, that is how to be rich. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of our lives. Too, too many to count. And we pray that you would take us and use us and spread us out into ways and into places and into other people's lives in ways that truly make a difference. Help us, Lord, we pray, 
to have ears to hear and eyes to see and courage to respond. Thank you for now the opportunity to be reminded that indeed you responded with total, total giving of yourself. Bless us, watch over us as we come to this table now in Jesus' name. Amen.